I am very, very happy to be here with uh, Gary Greenberg. This is a fantastic book. And I must say, when I uh, first heard about it, I wasn't sure uh, if it would be very engaging, because I thought it might be like inside baseball of psychiatry, etc. And in some sense, it is inside baseball of psychiatry. But it's how uh, basically we construct our notions of health and illness, suffering and satisfaction, uh, and how we construct what is a meaningful life and what isn't uh, out of our experience. And I got interested in the DSM because uh, I'm writing a book about a community that has been very much impacted by changes in the DSM, which is the uh, community of autistic people. And as you know, there's like a raging debate going on that's been going on for uh, over a decade now about why the number of autism diagnoses have been going up so much. And one of the things that's interesting about that is that the experts say something that's completely different from the people who are most affected by uh, those rising numbers. The experts tend to say those rising numbers are caused by broadened diagnostic criteria and better case finding. Well, what does that mean? Well, the broadened diagnostic criteria are in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, the so-called Bible of Psychiatry. And as you probably know or else you would be here, the new edition of the Bible of Psychiatry, the DSM-5, is going to come out when? Weeks? This weekend. This, this weekend. Right here in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to miss this. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, is it right here in San Oh, it's at the APA? Yeah, yeah. Um, new editions of the DSM change the way that we think about the mind, uh, change the way that uh, insurance companies reimburse Doctors change the access that uh, kids have to special education classes. It's an enormously influential book. Uh, and yet something amazing happened just uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is that Thomas Insel of the National Institute, Institute of Mental Health, he's sort of our psychiatrist in chief, more or less, um, made an amazing statement on his blog. Um, he said, the goal of this new manual as with all previous editions, is to provide a common language for describing psychopathology. While DSM has been described as a Bible for the field, it is, at best, a dictionary, creating a set of labels and defining each. The strength of each of the editions of the DSM has always been reliability. Each edition has ensured that clinicians use the same terms in the same, way, in the same ways. The weakness is its lack of validity. Gary, would you mind telling us what the difference between reliability and validity is? I wouldn't mind. Yeah. Uh, but I want to say something about this statement that Tom Insel made, because this is really interesting. Uh, he, he came out three weeks before the new DSM came out and basically said, you know, everybody knows that the DSM sucks, and uh, we have a better way of going about it. The U.S. government is no longer going to rely on the DSM. We have a better way of going about it, which we can talk about what this better way is. But why I wanted to bring that up before I answer Steve's question is that the um, question is, why would he do that? Why would he come out three weeks before the book comes out and kick these people in the pants? They just spent $25 million and 15 years to write this book. And whether it's good or bad, uh, you would think that these guys would be together. And by the way, today they issued a kumbaya press, con press release. They kissed and they made up in public. Yeah, they didn't do it on Oprah, but uh, you know, they, they, they said that really we're all on the same page. But anyway, the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because what he's doing there is he's trying to change the whole game by saying to the community of researchers, we know that you don't like this book, the DSM. And we know that it makes your life harder. It makes your life harder because it's a collection of diagnoses that don't really exist. And everybody knows that they don't really exist. But you're stuck using those diagnoses. If you want to get a study approved by the National Institute of Health, you have to tie it to a diagnosis. If you want to get a drug approved by the FDA, at least if you want to go the so-called easy way, you have to show that that drug works for a particular diagnosis. Well. If the diagnoses don't exist, it's going to be really hard to do research on something that isn't real. 
and it's scientific research anyway. I mean, there's certain kinds of research you can do, just not scientific. Um, and so using the DSM to understand mental illness is like using a map of the moon to get around San Francisco. It just doesn't work. So the reason, I'm, I'm, the reason that Incel did this is because he wants researchers to be encouraged to come over to the other side. And I think that's really an interesting comment because psychiatry has been chugging along on the back of the DSM, this particular kind of DSM, the DSM-5, which is, you know, a thousand pages long, for 35 years. And it's not exactly a repudiation. He's taking the repudiation for granted. He's not announcing that the DSM is terrible. He's saying, we all know it's terrible. Let's see if I can do something. No, oh, so, so wait, did you want yeah. to say about reliability? Yes. So the, the, this is also worth knowing. The DSM is, re, is supposedly reliable. What that means is that uh, any two clinicians, given a patient, will, uh, can use the DSM to come to the same conclusion about which diagnosis <laughs> the patient warrants. And that's its only claim to the scientific uh, respectability. Now, it's not, it's not a trivial claim. It's really hard if you think about language. You think about trying to describe a friend to a third person and how much room there is for misunderstanding. And then put yourself in a position where what you're saying isn't just gossip or description. It actually matters if you're trying to help another doctor figure out how to treat somebody or you're trying to convey information to a family. The language has to be more precise than we usually our language is. And so what the DSM does is it creates a precise language that people can rely on to uh, the people can rely on to communicate with each other. What the DSM is not What the DSM is not is a collection of disorders that actually exist, and that's what it means to say that it's not valid. That's what Tom himself was trying to say. Now, I actually want to uh, not press you on that, but just ask you, when you say these disorders don't exist, you see clients, mm -hmm. you are a practicing psychotherapist, you, more than most people, are aware of the reality of their suffering and the challenges that they face in day-to-day -day life. So what do you mean when you say these disorders don't exist? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a convergence of medicine and therapy that happened maybe 70 years ago. Uh, and that's a whole interesting story that I, I tell a little bit about in this book. But the upshot of it is that in order for uh, psychiatry and, and the mental health professions in general to provide what amounts to a medical service, uh, we in the field have to claim that we're treating illnesses. Yeah. And in order to do that, we have had to, they have had to create this DSM, which provides a language that supposedly um, puts these, puts suffering in medical terms. It uh, creates a, a, a way, the DSM creates a way for uh, us to not only have a common language, but for that common language to be medical. And the problem here is that, obviously, we don't know, we don't, these diseases don't exist in the same way that cancer exists. They don't exist in the same way that infectious diseases exist. There's a model out there, and I'm sure you all know this. There's a model of illness, a model of disease, and it is that disease is a form of suffering that's caused by a biochemical pathogen. There's something wrong inside the body that makes you sick, and that's why you have your symptoms. And all of medicine is full of diseases that don't meet that model. But some medical diseases do meet that model. Pneumonia is a really good example. And medicine has been controlled by that myth since the middle 19th century, when these miraculous discoveries of drugs and germs were made. And since then, Suffering, there's been a great impetus to understand more and more suffering as the result of this kind of uh, problem inside the body. And you can see why, because after all, if, you, if we could say our suffering is caused that way, then we might be able to come up with cures for it. Well, very few 
it's just, <coughs> there's a lot of medical diseases that don't fit under that, but there are no psychiatric illnesses that do. No what? There are no psychiatric illnesses that fit that model. There are no psychiatric illnesses, mental illnesses, for which we know what the underlying pathology is, if there is an underlying pathology. It's not unlikely that there isn't a single one. So I don't know if that's answering your question, because frankly, I forgot the question. Uh, no, it's fine. Oh. And you, it, it, well, we were talking about reliability. Oh, oh so yeah. you, you're, asking me, you're asking me about, so the people I see, the suffering is real. Right. The suffering is real. The question is whether the best way to understand that suffering, both intellectually, scientifically, and also in terms of pragmatics, in terms of treatment, is as a disease. That's the question. And the fact is, nobody knows the answer to that question yet. So far, the answer, the, the answer the, the, there's not a convincing answer one way or the other. But certainly, psychiatry hasn't made its case yet. So, what Thomas Insel suggested in that blog post was that instead of using the DSM as the basis for research, use something called research domain criteria. Mm. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, I can. I mean, I can try. The research domain criteria is this idea. So here's, here's, what, here's what the idea is. We know certain things about certain, the neurocircuitry of certain, uh, certain, it's hard to say because it's all in the animal model. What we know is, for instance, if there's something called a startle response. The startle response, it can be observed in animals. It's what it sounds like. It's what happens when you startle a rabbit, let's say. And if you startle a rabbit a whole lot and then you kill it, which really startles it, and then you chop up its brain and you look at its brain, you can actually begin to discover what happens inside the brain uh, that caused that startle response. So you can begin to unpack what they call the neurocircuitry of startle, or the neurocircuitry of fear. You can scare the bejesus out of an animal and do the same kind of thing. And so what Insel is suggesting is that we should go to what we know about already. We should start with this neurocircuitry <laughs> that we know that's related to, uh, on the animal model anyway, to symptoms of, in humans, what are mental disorders. Um, and so either what he's doing is he's directing attention to the, um, the underlying neurocircuitry of the symptoms of mental illness, or He's suggesting that we look where we know, which is not that much different from saying, like the drunk person who looks for his keys under the light, because that's where the light is, not necessarily because that's where he lost it. In other words, it might not be the right direction to look. Nobody knows, and it's going to be a long time before anybody does. That's the thing. Like, I wanted Incel's uh, critique to be, you know, this bracing wake-up call, but when I thought about the research domain criteria when I thought about, okay, yeah, that sounds good. Instead of these vague clinical observations, let's base our diagnoses on brain circuits. <coughs> Do we know what brain circuit is malfunctioning, say, in depression? Not, not even, I mean, orders of magnitude uh, by it, no. Right. And, and we will never know because there's no way there's a single brain or group of brain. Depression is caused differently in different people. We're all different and depression is a very heterogeneous concept. And no, there isn't, we don't know anything about that. We know something about the neurocircuitry of the kind of apathy that we see in a, 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 a depressed animal. If you subject an animal to a certain kind of torture, you can dis demoralize it sufficiently that it becomes what on the animal model is depressed. And again, you can cut up its brain, which depresses it terribly. And you can look at the neurocircuitry of that, but no, we're not, right. not even we're right. not even we're not even in the neighborhood. In addition, there's another problem, which is that how do we know that the brain is all that it takes to give us consciousness? We don't know that. Yeah. We know that it's the necessary condition of consciousness, but we have no way of knowing it's a sufficient condition of consciousness. There's no way, and maybe we never will. There's an assumption there that I just don't think we should. Take lightly. Yeah. Or do you have an urge to read? No, I don't. Oh, okay. I, I'm right. thinking I might, but I don't. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing a uh, an, uh, an ad on YouTube for an antidepressant, I believe it was called Seroquel, and it had like little serotonin 
uh, you know, cartoon characters circulating around. That model of depression turned out to be uh, bogus. It was a myth. It was yeah. never. It was never real. I mean, the idea that depression is a neurochemical imbalance that's corrected by antidepressants <laughs> is a myth. And I mean that in the most uh, sort of respectful way. A myth is not just a lie. If I thought it was a lie, I'd say it was a lie. It's a myth. It's a story that gets told to people to help them get through their lives. It just doesn't happen to be true. Uh, or at least as far as we know. And we certainly know that raising levels of serotonin it directly, whatever else is going on, that's not what's causing the effect. That's not what antidepressants are doing to change your experience. Since, though, you're not just theorizing about these things, but you're actually on the front lines every day with your clients, if someone comes in and says, I, I can barely get out of bed, it was very difficult for me to be here, um, you know, I have no passion in my life anymore, I can barely function, um, what directions do you take them in? Well, I take them in the directions that you would imagine psychotherapists take them in. I try to help them understand the problem I try to, you know, I start with the assumption that medicine starts with the assumption that whatever you're suffering from, the disease that you're suffering from, should be eliminated. It should be eliminated in your life, and ideally it should be eliminated in everybody's life. That, you don't, you don't really think about it, but to say that a, something is a disease is to say that it should be eradicated. Smallpox is a triumph of medicine for exactly that reason. And if we were to eliminate cancer, it would be undoubtedly a triumph of medicine. But therapy starts with the assumption that maybe it shouldn't be eliminated. Maybe the suffering actually means something. And so when a person comes to me, I don't really have anything, the DSM has nothing to do with what I do with them except for one thing, and that's money. And that's only if uh, I work it out with them that they're going to, and I do want to read something here because I think this is interesting if I can find it. So.